Ambassador, oh, I want to show something. I want to bring you in. I want to yeah. show you, you. People remember you as a star impeachment witness. You got a, a subpoena. That was much ado about nothing. Ari. Well, you got it. I showed it. You yeah. said at the time it was a quid pro quo. You confirmed well, it as I, as I said to Peter a moment ago, I had a quid pro quo this morning. I went to Starbucks and I gave them my American Express card and they gave me a cup of coffee. Right. But a That's commercial, a well, quo. under law, a commercial transaction is different than a quid pro quo, which I think you know because you were at the center of that. And after January 6th, we, we saw... Uh, what Ms. Matthews did. Uh, let's listen to where you drew a line in the sand. Completely in, even with all of the foibles that everyone has already identified, and I don't need to go through them again, until January 6th. It was a no for me after that. A no for you after that. Why was it important for you to say no more Trump because of his January 6th conduct? And do you stand by that? No, I don't stand by it. And I'll tell you why. I've now lived four years under the Biden-Harris policies, and I have to say that those policies are not only becoming an existential threat to our country's way of life, but to our allies as well. So when you, and this, it has is, to, this is, no, so no, Ambassador, me, no, this is, I'll let you finish, already, but this no, is I want so to striking. You said it was a no for me after that, I did, after I January did, 6th, I did. and here we are right now, I did. and you're saying it's a yes for you. It is a yes for me. It is an absolute yes for me. That is how badly the Biden-Harris team have prosecuted their job. But the whole point you seem to be making was that January 6th and that kind of attack on democracy is bigger than any but policy I'm see difference. I am seeing so many attacks on democracy that eclipse January 6th. So I want to ask Sarah... If you want to ask are, me what those I are, I'm happy. Well, I want to. I'm not going to go there in the back. I would love to see you. But this is. I appreciate ask Kamala Harris why she flip flopped on 16 things. Oh, look, I appreciate everyone being here. What's going on is Anton from AntonDaniels.com. I appreciate you guys for continuing to rock with me. The left is so surprised. I think that they are in for a rude awakening, because people, people have suffered so much under this regime that they called an administration that. They are completely deflecting away from the Democratic Party. And I think that obviously, as predicted, the honeymoon phase was going to completely wear off. And now you have platforms that decided that they wanted to go live, like the MSNBCs and the CNNs. And they're being surprised at the fact or the idea that people are unwilling to ignore what they've seen happen over the last three and a half years. And it's nothing short of incompetent, 100%. I mean, even all the way up until today, because you don't even have to remember what happened in 2021. I mean, censorship was real. Forget the inflation part, because inflation was something that I even predicted because it was the only method that they had to leverage the Fed in order to raise interest rates. And they, they told you that it was going to be pain. But the strategy was to implement the pain early because of the incompetence of their ability to be able to manage. And then while at the same time, implementing the immigrant crisis, right? And so they knew that it was going to be a border crisis because that was a strategy. The strategy was to let everybody in and then eventually be able to market the idea that, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, we stopped the flow of migrants into the country. But then two things had to happen. Number one, you had to completely ignore the fact that everybody was coming in here. And then number two, you had to ignore the fact that you was getting your car repossessed or your home foreclosed on and you had to still keep voting blue. Let me ask y'all a question. Because everybody tells me, and this is what I thought growing up, but I was completely wrong. I mean, I thought that the Democratic Party was the party that actually helped free the slaves, and I was wrong. I just couldn't believe it. The history behind the Democratic Party is so deep, dark, and demonic, it was amazing. Let me ask you all a question. As I grew up, one of the things that they always used to say, family in particular, because you know what's happening in the black culture, often at times you're called a sellout, or... Or even better, they just get on you and they shame you about the fact that you decided to even think about an opposite candidate or vote Republican. You know, I got my absentee ballot in today. Absolutely awesome. Got my app. Well, I don't want to show you because uh, I don't want my address to be all over this joint. But I got my absentee ballot in today uh, because I'm not sure if I'm going to be in town in order to vote. So I wanted to make sure that I got my vote in. And... I just got back from my brother's 50th birthday party, and they know me, obviously, and they just wanted to ask, Anton, what do you think about Project 2025? Anton, what made you even switch to think about going Republican? You just always been rebellious. No, I just ask questions. 
And I don't want to continue to be on this plantation now that I know the history and now that I've started to see it with my own eyes that over the last 12 or the 16 years, there's only been four of them that we've been completely scandal free, that we've been pulling out and getting away from war, that we're no longer the war party and all of these things. And so the more that I uncover, the more that I realize that, man, all of these years that I've been voting or all of these years that they've been preaching it to me, even before I was able to vote, we've been literally leaning into our own demise. I mean, at least the, the candidates from yesteryear, such as the Clintons, you know, they sold you under the guise that, yeah, man, we're leaning into prosperity. When in reality, in reality, they were selling us out, right? They sold our futures and gave us crumbs in the meantime and said, look at how well we're doing. In reality, they sold our jobs overseas. They gave everything to China. And the North American Free Trade Agreement was absolutely a disaster while manufacturing the housing crisis. And then we leapfrog up to Obama, and they, the only thing that people can tell me is that, man, he a smooth guy, and he really knows how to endear himself to the public, and he's a smooth talker. Wait a minute. What does smooth talking have to do with policy and legacy and the fact that we've been left with a bag of bricks, especially with regard to all of the repercussions that came along with aligning himself with the alphabet community? That don't matter. And then they want Kamala Harris to be the same thing. So they handpicked her because they knew that we wasn't going for it because we got short memories and we lean into identity politics as a culture. But some stuff we just be like, ah, no, not that one. Not that one. And so they gave us Kamala Harris, even though, again, she couldn't debate her way out of a wet paper bag. And they gave us Kamala Harris. And I said, OK, all right, I see how this play is going. So I just lean back into what I've seen over the last three and a half years, they tried to bamboozle us while they pushed Biden out because they knew that Biden was incompetent, but they sold us on Biden and he was so great, even though he couldn't even think for himself or stand up for an extended period of time. And it took him 30 minutes just to walk down the stairs from the debate stage. And so they gave us Kamala Harris and we said, OK, and then they gave us Tim Walls and they said, he's America's dad and she's Mamala. And I said, ah, I don't know about him. And I started doing some research. And next thing you know, he was lying about going to China trips and all of this stuff. And then they tried to have a little bit of election interference, especially with uh, the charges down there in Georgia and in New York and trying to find anything that they could to prevent us from being able to vote for the person that they knew was going to challenge the status quo, drain the swamp and continue the thing that he did. That was so awesome. The last four years that he was in office from 2016 through 2020. And so now you see people completely deflecting away and they just can't believe it. It's like, I can't believe that y'all would even think about the possibility of voting for Trump. Because let's be honest, most people are not voting for Kamala Harris. They're voting against Trump or they vote on identity politics. And I would think that that's probably 70 to 80 percent because even when I do street interviews and I talk to people and they say, well, I ain't going to vote for Trump. They don't say that they're voting for Kamala Harris. They can't name anything that they like about her. They can't even tell you if you question them or you press them a little bit more. They can't tell you why they would vote for Kamala Harris, considering what they've experienced over the last three and a half years. I mean, if we had experienced something great or extraordinary or awesome or people got more buying power. And I think that J.D. Vance absolutely hit the nail on the head when he said, listen, if it's so awesome, how come they didn't do it the last three and a half years? And we are supposed to just completely cover up our eyes when it comes to the migrant crisis. And even recently, even recently, their inability to get a deal done when it came to the ports, but they did it in four days because it would have absolutely torpedoed their own campaign, despite all of the love and the glam and the Drew Barrymore Mamala quotes and stuff that they had going on, that we were supposed to just go for it. But I see a lot of people that they didn't expect to turn their back on the Democratic Party and said, you know what, our lives was better under Trump. And we actually like what he's proposing. And we don't want to continue to be in these proxy wars. And then the nail in the coffin for me, as of right now, because listen, we got like a whole month left. The nail in the coffin right now for me is the fact that, and as you listen to her, look at her talk right here. She's not even in Detroit, but she's in Redford, but they'll say that they're in Detroit. The nail in the coffin for me is FEMA response to this recent hurricane. That absolutely devastated North Carolina and Florida and Georgia and Tennessee and all of the likes, everything else that was behind it. $750, and then they said that FEMA was possibly broke. And then they said that uh, they spent over a billion dollars in FEMA, FEMA funds for immigrants over the last two years. 
Nope. Nope, we're not going. So listen, I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you guys are aware. I hope y'all tap into After Hours tonight. Join the Patreon. Link is in the description. Also, teach Hanley 40% off your first order, 20% off of life. And then last but not least, make sure you come and kick it with your boy in Atlanta and, and, and Detroit. And Detroit. November 2nd, December 14th. I love you. I appreciate you. I'm going to holler at you later. Peace.